Well, hello, everybody. Um, so, um, finally, we get to uh, have a look through the um, reply from Kathleen Zellner to uh, the bizarre uh, response from the state in which uh, I haven't even just read through the first part of the response. Um, as I suspected, um, Kathleen Zellner is uh, at her usual um, full force. So let's have a, a look through without any further ado, and let's have a look and see what um, what the state, what, what she has replied to the state with. So hopefully this will all work fine. Um, so let me just check as usual, check, make sure that everything is working satisfactorily. Um, and then we can get on with, there we go, okie dokie. So, let's pop up the state's response. Sorry, I just noticed then a few more people joining in. Hi, everyone. Um, in case you uh, have have read it before, apologies. But uh, if you haven't, then here we go. Um, here's the response um, from Casey. Damn it, I'm getting more American every day. Casey, eh? Who would have believed I'd be saying Casey? Um, We can skip all this stuff on appeal from the orders denying, denying, denying post-conviction relief and additional scientific testing entered in the Circuit Court of Manitowoc County, case number, the Honourable, yeah, the Dishonourable Judge sucks at this, super witch, whatever you want to say. Anyway, um, let's have a look at what uh, what she's, pitten, she's put. Table of contents, introduction one, an argument. The state is stopped from bringing procedural bar claims. I don't know about you, but I wanted to. I wanted to just quickly check and see what what was meant by a stopped. And here's what it is. Hi, Eunice. How are you doing? Hi, Paul. I'm fine. How Good. How's the barbecue going? It's finished now. All right. Okay. Okay. So anyway, um, what is the meaning of a stopple or a stopped? A stopple. A bar or impediment. A Obstruction which precludes a person from asserting a fact or a right or prevents one from denying a fact. Such a hindrance is due to a person's actions, conduct, statements, admissions, failure to act or judgment against the person in an incidental legal case. So <laughs> I can't help thinking if the state are arguing legally, procedurally barred, Kathleen Zellner is firing the, the same stuff back at her, back at them, but with a different word. I might be wrong, but I think that's what uh, what we're saying. The state's erroneous application of the fundamental principles of post-conviction relief. Mr. Avery's claims are not procedurally barred. The circuit, the circuit court erroneously exercised its discretion in denying Mr. Avery's motion to vacate and motion for reconsideration in contradiction of the 2007 order by the most dangerous person ever to enter Judge Willis's courthouse. The state mischaracterizes Steve's arguments regarding trial defense counsel's ineffectiveness. Mr. Avery's Brady and Youngblood claims are not barred because they were raised in supplemental motions because Mr. Avery's factual allegations must be assumed as true, he is entitled to an evidentiary hearing, and finally, the conclusion. Okay, so I um, don't think we need to go through all of the usual stuff at the beginning, which they're going to quote at various points. Introduction. Um, Stephen Avery has spent <laughs> 5,343 days, or 128,223, Two, 232 hours behind bars for this, his second wrongful conviction. He has endured the mental anguish of knowing that he is innocent and his constitutional rights to a fair trial were violated. 
I like this. The state, in a desperate effort to keep Mr. Avery imprisoned, devotes 104 pages to arguing that Steve's claims are procedurally barred. However, the state ignores the most important undisputed fact that refutes its entire argument that Mr. Avery, Avery is procedurally barred from bringing his new claims because there was an agreement on September the 18th, 2017, between the state, i.e. Crater Face himself, Tom Fallon, and Mr. Avery, that Mr. Avery could amend his June 2017th uh, 97406 97, motion without opposition from the state, perform additional scientific testing, and schedule a four-week evidentiary hearing if needed. Proof of the agreement is evidenced by the undisputed fact that the state did not object to Mr. Avery's October 6th 2017 motion to vacate the the October 3rd 2017 court ordered dis, court order dismissing his June 2007 97406 motion the circuit court also recognized that the state and Mr Avery had made an agreement as described above because of the undisputed agreement between Mr Avery and the state that he could amend his June 2017 motion, all the current state's arguments about Mr. Avery, Avery being procedurally barred are waived and the state should be stopped from raising the procedural bar arguments. The circuit court orders are replete with legal errors as the state points out in states brief 17, 20, 102, 103, 104, 108. Because of its legal errors, the circuit court failed to address many of the issues Mr. Avery raised. So there is no record of those for this court to determine whether the circuit court erroneously exercised its discretion. In fact, it is an erroneous exercise of discretion to fail to exercise discretion over multiple issues. However, alternatively, if this court engages with the state's arguments, Mr. Avery presents sufficient reasons why his claims are not procedurally barred, including the two supplements to his June 2017 motion allowed by this court, which conclusively defeat the state's claim that successive and not supplemental motions were filed. Additionally, Mr. Avery presents Brady and Youngblood, cl Youngblood claims discovered after his June 2017 motion and new evidence which are not procedurally barred. At trial, the state's primary witness, Bobby Dassey, Bobby committed perjury when he testified that Miss Holbach never left the Avery property and that he was asleep when he was doing internet searches. He has a direct connection to the murder by his subsequent admissions, violent pornography and word searches that reflect knowledge of the crime and the victim, motive and opportunity to commit the crime and plant evidence against Mr. Avery, including bones from his burn barrel and blood from Mr. Avery's sink. Trial Defence Council failed to hire the necessary experts and failed to investigate and establish third party suspects pursuant to State versus Denny. Blah, blah, blah. Most importantly, the state's primary witness, Bobby, prior post-conviction counsel, was ineffective in all the same ways. Current post-conviction counsel has uncovered numerous Brady and Youngblood violations, the culminative effect of which undermines confidence in the verdict. The state's brief fundamentally the state's brief fundamentally misunderstands the basic facts of the case. 
the law of the case effect of the supplements that this court allowed, the effect of the court's legal, circuit court's legal errors, and the estoppel effect of the 2017 agreement between Mr. Avery and the state. Let's have a look and see what he's put, she's put here. The state argues that Mr. Avery relies upon the incorrect standard of review for a trial court's rulings by using the term abuse of discretion. Wisconsin's change from abuse of discretion to erroneous exercise of discretion language is a distinction without a difference. As the court stated, we are not changing the standard of review, just the Lucotian Lucotian argument. Oh. Nearly went too fast. Here we go. OK, <laughs> as I say, the word is stopped is like a bar. So she's saying that the that the state is barred <laughs> from bringing procedural bar claims. In Wisconsin, the doctrine of judicial estoppel is used to prevent litigants from playing fast and loose with the judicial system by maintaining inconsistent positions during the litigation. Specifically, judicial estoppel precludes a party from asserting a position in a legal proceeding, proceeding and subsequently asserting an inconsistent position. Contrary to the state's argument that it does not matter what the parties agreed to, the state's prior agreement with Mr. Avery, Avery's counsel utterly disqualifies the state's procedural bar arguments the focus of the state's brief. The state is is, stopped, is barred from entirely changing its position in arguing that Mr. Avery is procedurally barred from raising his claims after it agreed that Mr. Avery could amend his motion, conduct additional, conduct additional scientific testing, and if need be, schedule a four-week evidential hearing. Judicial Estoppel applies to the party's positions, not that of the judge. A reviewing court determines de novo whether the elements of judicial estoppel apply to the facts of a case. Three elements are required for a court to invoke the doctrine of judicial estoppel. The latter, the later, one, the later position must be clearly inconsistent with the earlier position. Two, the facts at issue should be the same in both cases. And three, the parties to be stopped must have convinced the first court to adopt its position. Mr. Avery meets all three elements for the following reasons. One, the state's current position that Mr. Avery is procedurally barred is clearly inconsistent with the state's September 18, 2017 agreement with Mr. Avery that he could amend his petition. The fact to the facts at issue are the same before this court and the circuit court. Three, the state, by not objecting to the existence of the agreement described in Mr. Avery's motion to vacate, convinced the circuit court that there was, in fact, an agreement. The state failed to object to Mr. Avery's motion to vacate. The state had the opportunity to object and failed to do so when Mr. Avery, Avery submitted his 97406 motion to vacate on October the 6th, 2017, which described the agreement for amending his motion, conducting additional scientific testing and scheduling a four-week evidentiary hearing if necessary. In his motion for relief from judgment, Mr. Avery specifically pled on October 6, 2017. Current post-conviction defence counsel spoke to the prosecutors and informed them that this motion would be filed today to vacate the order. This motion has been presented to and reviewed by the prosecutors and the prosecutors agree to the factual accuracy of the representations regarding the content of the September 18, 27 meeting made in this motion. 
when current post-conviction post counsel asked whether the circuit court should immediately be formed of the agreement, Prosecutor Fallon stated that once he had finalized the scheduling of the RAV4 examination with law enforcement, a stipulated order could be presented to the circuit court, similar to the original stipulated order for independent scientific testing entered on November the 23rd, 2016. Mr. Avery relied upon the agreement with the state and the state's request for a additional time to schedule the testing of the RAV4. By not objecting to Mr. Avery's motion to vacate, the state has waived this argument on appeal. The state should be stopped from changing its position now. Let's go back up here. Vitally important evidence must be tested with more sensitive DNA testing, including the following. Ha. I hope you're, hope you're we, watching this, uh, Mr. Woody or Miss Woody, Woodpecker Woody. The blood stain, A23. What has Dr. Silkman been going on about for ages? The blood stain, A23, on the RAV4's Rio Cargo door and eight latent prints found on the RAV4, both of which exclude Mr. Avery, unidentified male DNA on the license plate, items AJ and AK, potential DNA on the battery cables, hood latch, interior hood release, and lug wrench, the suspected human pelvic bones, and any other DNA testing of the interior and exterior of the RAV4 that could produce new evidence of a third-party suspect. Mr. Avery relied upon the state's representations that it agreed to allow him to amend his motion, conduct new scientific testing and schedule a four week evidentiary hearing if needed. How are we doing? How are we doing? We're getting on quite, quite well through this, I think. Um, let's carry on then. Um, the state's erroneous application of the fundamental principles of post-conviction review pleading standard. The state argues that Mr. Avery must affirmatively allege that his facts were sufficiently pled, which is not the actual standard. The proper standard is from State v. Allen, um, which Mr. Avery satisfied in his brief even presenting a chart for greater clarity. Standard governing a petitioner's right to an evidentiary hearing. The state argues 13, time, 13 times that Mr. Avery failed to prove his facts and disprove the state's case. Uh, see states, uh, several pages, but see states, uh, brief 23, conceding that an evidentiary hearing is a forum to prove factually supported claims. The standard is that the facts must be assumed to be true in determining whether to grant an evidentiary hearing. The state fails to assume Mr. Avery's facts are true as the standard requires. The state reverts to a sufficiently proven standard, which does not exist. Mr. Avery is not required to prove the facts supporting his claims before this court. Now, the state's brief inadvertently concedes the need for a hearing by creating numerous factual disputes in arguing and weighing the evidence see the factual dispute chart. Ironically, the state uses the term conclusory 25 times in a conclusory fashion to describe Mr. Avery's arguments without explaining what is conclusory about them. So post-conviction movement need only provide sufficient objective factual assertions to be entitled to an evidentiary hearing. That is, 
A movement need not demonstrate theories of admissibility for every factual assertion he or she seeks, seeks to introduce. Uh, okay, so three. Mr. Avery's claims are not procedurally barred. Mr. Avery is not procedurally barred by his 2013 motion. The state argues Mr. Avery failed to show sufficient reasons for not raising his June 27, his June 2017 claims in his 2013 pro se motion, arguing that Mr. Avery's indigence and lack of legal training were not sufficient reasons. The state's brief claims Avery's assertion that he was incapable of recognizing and raising legal claims was dis demonstrably false. The circuit court remarked that Avery's pro se motion recognized significant legal issues with the court previously ruled on. However, the circuit court's recent opinion is disingenuine because the circuit court previously ruled that Mr. Avery's claims in his pro se motion were unsubstantiated, empty and without substance, completely meritless, bordering on frivolous and wildly, wildly speculative. Miraculously, the state has transformed Mr. Avery into a legal scholar to serve its own purposes. Mr. Avery has demonstrated sufficient reasons throughout his brief and supporting affidavits. Affidavits are considered part of the pleading. Uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court found that an affidavit was not insufficient to make a claim for newly discovered evidence, reasoning that a movement, a movement need not demonstrate the admissibility of the facts asserted in the post-conviction motion, but rather must show sufficient objective material, factual assertions that if true would warrant the movement to relief. The state misinterprets Mr. Avery's argument to conclude that Mr. Avery's claims were available to him since 2013. In 2013, Mr. Avery lacked legal knowledge, had cognitive deficiencies, and had no way of knowing the factual and legal basis of the claims in the instant appeal. Mr. Avery's 2013 motion demonstrates this as none of his 11 issues were meritorious or could have possibly raised the subsequently discovered Brady, Youngblood, new evidence or ineffective assistance of counsel arguments. He had no way of acquiring knowledge of the factual or legal basis for his current claims. The state concedes that Mr. Avery's pursuit of his pro se petition was diligent, but he failed despite his diligence. The fact Mr. Avery in 2013 was diligent despite the unavailable unavailability of the necessary information supports his, his position. Another case where the Supreme Court found that the habeas petitioner was entitled to an evidentiary hearing on a juror bias claim since he was diligent in his efforts to develop the facts. Because Williams was not on notice of the juror basis issue, the Supreme Court found that Williams did not fail in his duty of due diligence. The Supreme Court held that unless there is a lack of diligence or some greater fault attributable to the prisoner or the prisoner's counsel, a failure to develop the factual basis of a claim is not established. So applying Williams to this case, Mr. Avery did not fail to assert claims of which he had no notice. Further, as in Williams, Steve's claims were unavailable to him even if he did have legal knowledge because they are based on evidence withheld by Brady and Youngblood violations, discoverable only by expert examination and not pursued or recognised by his pre previous prior attorneys. Because Steve 
is a learning disabled indigent prisoner. He sh simply could not have been aware of the factual basis of his claims. The, response, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has also found sufficient reason where the movement lacked factual awareness of the claim. State versus Allen. Now, even if Mr. Avery knew he needed experts, he could not persuade any experts to assist him. Therefore, he could not have known that the blood had been selectively planted in the RAV4. The bullet fragment, FL, had wood and not bone embedded in it. The hood latch swab never, the hood latch swab never swabbed a hood latch. A hood latch. Miss Harmack's subkey could not have fallen from the bookcase and the subsequent discovery of numerous Brady and Youngblood violations. Mr. Avery wrote to dozens of attorneys, all of whom rejected his request. After his direct appeal was denied, Mr. Avery also wrote to laboratories that would not respond unless he had an attorney. Mr. Avery described the impossibility of his efforts to get experts due to his pro se status, not lack of awareness that he needed them. The circuit court should have granted an evidentiary hearing on Mr. Avery's allegation that he lacked the factual basis in 2013 to make the correct claims. Significantly, the state ignores State versus Anderson, which Mr. Avery relied upon in his June 2017 2017 motion in Anderson the defendant like Mr Avery argued that his cognitive deficiencies provided a sufficient reason for not raising certain claims prior to his 97406 motion the court was skeptical skeptical of Anderson's claims regarding his disability but the court assumed Anderson's disabilities excused his failure to raise the claims earlier Applying Anderson, Mr. Avery is not barred from raising his claims because he raised several sufficient reasons, including his cognitive deficiencies, impossibility of hiring experts and lack of factual and legal awareness for explaining why he could not raise his claims in his 2013 motion. The circuit court failed to rule on prior post-conviction counsel's ineffectiveness. The circuit court failed to address prior post-conviction counsel's ineffectiveness because it applied the wrong legal standard. The circuit court stated, a circuit court is not authorised by statute to resolve claims of ineffective assistance of appellate, appellate counsel. In this matter, if the defendant wishes to pursue his claims regarding his appellate counsel, the defence may file a night motion with the Court of Appeals. So, Wisconsin law requires a defendant to present a claim of ineffective assistance of post-conviction counsel to the trial court in the first instance. See State Rotherham versus McCaultry. Uh, a night petition is only appropriate for claims of ineffective assistance by appellate counsel. See Jackson versus Bainan. Because Mr. Avery alleges ineffective assistance of post-conviction counsel, not appellate counsel, the circuit court improper, improperly refused to rule on his claim. Now, the state acknowledges that the circuit court was wrong about the law on post-conviction procedure because it confused the procedure for raising ineffective assistance of post-conviction counsel with the procedure for raising ineffective assistance of appellate counsel when rejecting this claim. However, the state argues that if the trial court reaches the proper result for the wrong reason, it will be affirmed, citing State versus Holt. Holt is distinguishable from this case. Holt involved the tri trial court's decision to deny a jury instruction. The appellate court found that the trial court's refusal to give the instruction was proper, even though the trial court's reasoning was incorrect. Unlike Holt, 
some dogs have arrived. Hi there. On you go, on you go. Go and enjoy some barbecue. <laughs> Holt. So, unlike Holt, where the record was sufficient to resolve the issue, in Mr. Avery's case, there is no underlying record or discretionary decision to review because the circuit court failed to rule on the issue. Now, because the circuit court applied the wrong standard and believed that the appellate court had to address the ineffectiveness of prior post-conviction counsel, it did not evaluate the substance of the claim, nor create a record for this court's review. Stated differently, the record lacks any discretionary decision for this court to review. Later versus Lubchenko. Um, and uh, in later, the appellate court remanded an issue for an evidentiary hearing because the circuit court failed to make a discretionary decision. So there was no record or decision for the appellate court to review. In Mr. Avery's case, in addition, in addition to failing to create a record for this court to review, the circuit, the circuit court, Judge Flowers, abused her discretion by refusing to rule on his ineffective assistance claim. The failure to exercise discretion is an abuse of discretion. McLeary versus State and State versus Jaworski. Now, in the State versus Quenzi, uh, when faced with a similar legal error by the trial court that resulted in no record for the appellate review, the court held if the circuit court is able to conduct an adequate retrospective hearing, it shall do so. Emphasis adding, it shall do so. Well, it should have done so, yes. Therefore, in the instant case, the court must hold an evidentiary hearing about the allegations of prior post-conviction counsel's ineffectiveness. So Mr. Avery pled sufficient reasons for failing to raise prior post-conviction counsel's ineffectiveness in his pro se motion. The state argues Mr. Avery fails to establish a sufficient reason for not including his current ineffective assistance of prior post-conviction counsel in his pro se direct appeal. Mr. Avery not only alleged a reason, he has demonstrated a sufficient reason consistent with Wisconsin statute and state versus Escalona. What constitutes a sufficient reason pursuant to Wisconsin statute 9740-6 is determined on a case by case basis. The Wisconsin Supreme Court has held that ineffective assistance of post-conviction counsel may constitute a sufficient reason. State versus Romero, Georgiana, and State versus Rothering and McCautry. Mr. Avery's pleading alleged sufficient facts for his claim of prior post-conviction counsel's ineffectiveness. Mr. Avery alleged sufficient facts about prior post-conviction counsel's ineffective failure to hire experts, conduct a significant investigation, or review discovery regarding potential third-party Denny suspects to warrant an evidentiary hearing. Clearly, post-conviction counsel recognized the need for experts on Mr. Avery's behalf because they asked the court for an extension to retain experts, stating, Council would be remiss if they did not consult with scientific experts on matters beyond their own knowledge and expertise, just as council would fail to satisfy their ethical obligations if they did not pursue potential leads for post-conviction relief. Despite recognising the need, prior post-conviction council did not retain any experts The pivotal question is whether Mr. Avery's motion is sufficient to entitle him to an evidentiary hearing where he would have the opportunity to show that his trial and prior post-conviction attorneys 
rendered ineffective assistance of counsel. Determining whether counsel's performance was deficient requires the court to focus on counsel's perspective at the time of trial or post-conviction. This determination often cannot be made without counsel's testimony, without which a court, a court cannot focus on counsel's perspective and cannot otherwise determine whether counsel's actions were the result of incompetence or deliberate trial strategies. Additionally, in State versus Curtis, the court held Assuming there are factual allegations, which, if found to be true, might warrant a finding of ineffective, ineffective assistance of counsel, an evidentiary hearing is a prerequisite to appellate review of an, effective, of, in, of an ineffective assistance of counsel issue. This court must assume, as true, trial defence counsel Strang's affidavit that Dean and Jerry were ineffective in that they failed to hire ballistics, trace and blood experts. The court must also assume that trial defence counsel were ineffective in failing to investigate and impeach the state's primary witness, Bobby, at trial, as evidenced by their investigator's affidavit. Additionally, Trial Defence Council was ineffective in numerous other ways. Number four, the Circuit Court erroneously exercised its discretion in denying Mr Avery's motion to vacate and motion for reconsideration in contradiction of the 2007 order by Judge Willis. Mr Avery properly argued that the state's refusal to vacate its judgment violated the 2007 Preservation and Testing Order. The state incorrectly asserts that Mr Avery failed to raise the argument regarding the Circuit Court's violation of the 2007 Preservation and Testing Order, claiming, quote, this argument appeared in none of Avery's motions to the Circuit Court. However, it did. In his second amended supplement, to his motion for reconsideration, Mr. Avery pled the effect of the court's failure to vacate its October the 3rd, 2017 ruling is that it has unilaterally blocked all future scientific testing in the Avery case in direct contravention of the April 4th, 2007 order entered by Judge Patrick Willis. The state cites, um, no, good luck with that one, Shonshek versus Paka. Um, Shonshek is in, op in, op in opposite and is not a post-conviction case. Rather, a products liability case in which a defendant manufactured of which a defendant manufacturer failed to mention even once that the plaintiff violated a Wisconsin statute until his appeal. Mr. Avery's newly discovered evidence in his motion for reconsideration. The state disputes Mr. Avery's evidence is newly discovered, citing to State versus Fosno and Vara versus State to argue that newly discovered evidence does not include the new appreciation of the importance of evidence previously known but not used. In Fosno, the defendant's new diagnosis was merely the new interpretation of existing, existing evidence. Similarly, in VARA, the evidence was newly discovered importance of evidence previously known and not used, where both the trial defence counsel and the defendant knew of the excuse me, the defendant's head injury, which could have supported an insanity defence. Both cases are in a, in, in, in a posit, in opposite, or well, presume inappropriate, because Mr Avery's newly discovered evidence does not consist 
of already known facts. Rather, post-trial experts revealed facts that were unreliable, unavailable at trial. In denying Mr. Avery's motion, the circuit court erroneously applied the newly discovered evidence standard to mean that the test could not be available at the time of the defendant's previous motion pursuant to Wisconsin statutes or any of the other appeals or motions filed after trial. The circuit court believed that the new evidence could not have existed before 2017. That is not the standard. When moving for a new trial based on newly discovered evidence, a defendant must prove one. The, the evidence was discovered after conviction. Two, the defendant was not negligent in seeking the evidence. Three, the evidence is material to an issue in the case. And four, the evidence is not merely cumulative. State versus McCollum. If the defendant can prove all four of these criteria, then it must be determined whether a reasonable, reasonable prob probability exists that had the jury heard the evidence, it would have had a reasonable date as to the defendant's guilt. Here, Mr. Avery presented the following new evidence. Dr. Christopher Palanek, using a 2016 state-of-the-art microscope, examined item FL and the hood latch swab and his findings have produced new evidence that is totally, I'll repeat that, is totally inconsistent with the state's theory that Miss Holbach was shot in the head while lying on Mr. Avery's garage floor and that the hood latch swab was actually used to swab a hood latch. Dr. John DeHaan, a forensic fire expert, determined that no body was ever burned in Mr. Avery's burn pit based upon data he collected from his experiments burning human cadavers since 2012. Dr. Carl Reich was able, through the use of new source testing, RSID testing, developed after the trial to eliminate blood, semen and saliva as the sources of DNA from the hood latch swab. To eliminate blood, semen and saliva, wow. And offered the opinion that the DNA was consistent, consistent with what would be found on Mr. Avery's groin swab from his skin cells. Five, the state mischaracterizes Mr. Avery's argument regarding trial defense counsel's ineffectiveness. The state mischaracterizes Mr. Avery's argument that trial defense counsel was ineffective, stating, in a nutshell, Avery argued in his June 2017 motion that Dean and Jerry were ineffective because Avery believes he could have prevailed at trial if Dean and Jerry had presented his planted evidence defense in the manner current post-conviction counsel formulated. But Mr. Avery never argued that trial defense counsel were ineffective for failing to present his planted evidence defense. Instead, Mr. Avery points out that they were ineffective for failing to hire experts, failing to investigate and impeach Bobby Dassey, failing to establish third party suspects and failing in numerous other ways. See Hinton versus Alabama, where trial counsel was ineffective for failing to hire a competent expert to bolster his trial defense that the defendant was misidentified as the killer. At last, an easy name to say. The state cites Lee versus the state for the proposition that permitting post-conviction post -conviction counsel quote, to argue a different game plan after the contest is over would be Monday morning quarter backing. However, Lee is distinguishable. 
Lee's defence was available at the time of trial, but his counsel merely chose not to pursue it. Conversely, Mr Avery is not arguing that his counsel could have chosen a different defence out of those available. Rather, he argues his counsel for ineffective for failing to hire experts or investigate. The state again misstates Mr Avery's argument by claiming that Mr Avery is contending that trial defence counsel should have hired his current specific current experts when Mr Avery actually argues that trial defence counsel was ineffective for failing to hire experts in these specific areas of expertise, i.e. blood spatter, DNA, trace, ballistics, police procedure, forensic fire and anthropology with Kerfmark specialization. Mr. Avery never argued that trial defense counsel should have hired his specific experts. Instead, Mr. Avery argues that trial defense counsel was ineffective, ineffective for fi failing to hire experts. The state claims Wisconsin has never found that a police procedure expert is admissible. However, Greg McCrary has been admitted by the, presumably somewhere else, is the rest of that. Besides this, the state grossly mischaracterizes Mr. Avery's ineffective assistance of counsel argument as being that the quantity test, quantity, Quantity testing results were both newly discovered evidence and that Dean and Jerry were ineffective for failing to present them. The newly discovered evidence supports Mr. Avery's argument that trial defense counsel failed to present an expert to establish that law enforcement planted Mr. Avery's DNA on the subkey. The reason Trial Defence Council did not discover this evidence was their failure to hire experts, which Trial Defence Council admits. And I must say, as I say, back in, um, it was December of 2018 when I went to see Jerry, he was fully expecting to be called as a, as an, as a witness in an evidentiary hearing for as he called it, his ineffective assistance of counsel. Um, anyway, thus the state cannot, even by misstating Mr. Avery's whole argument, rebut trial defence counsel's ineffectiveness. Item six, Mr. Avery's Brady and Youngblood claims are not barred because they were raised in supplemental motions. The state claims that Mr. Avery's motions are successive. However, as per the appellate court's orders, Mr. Avery's motions are supplemental motions in February 20, so see June 11th, 2018 and February 27th, 2019. The law on the case doctrine is a long-standing rule, long-standing rule that a decision on a legal issue by an appellate court establishes the law of the case which must be followed in all subsequent proceedings in the trial court or on later appeal. State versus Stewart, um, and citing Univest Corp versus General Split Corp, um, internal citation admitted. Even so, the state accuses Mr. Avery of filing in a piecemeal fashion. Filing under the same case number is, by nature, not piecemeal litigation. See Bannister versus Davis, Director, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, Correctional Institutions Division, US 2020, where the Supreme Court recently held that a Rule 59 motion to alter or amend a habeas court's judgment is not a second or successive habeas petition, but rather part of the first full petition. Mr. Avery's motions and supplements were all filed under the same case number and are simply a continuation of the same proceeding. See Gonzalez versus Crosby. 
Issue preclusion doctrines are inappropriate where the record reflects that the petitioner is diligently pursuing his claims and supporting facts in his first meaningful post-conviction review. See Lonka versus Thomas, 1996, holding that abuse of the writ doctrines have no application in a first habeas corpus proceeding and Williams, in 2000, holding that a prisoner who acts diligently to pursue his claims has not failed to preserve his right to a hearing on his claims. Mr. Avery has sufficiently pled his young blood claim, even though it is undisputed that the state violated the notice required requirement of Wisconsin statute on evidence preservation the state claims that Mr. Avery cannot prove its bad faith and thus makes an insufficient claim under Youngblood. The argument that Mr. Avery alleges a statutory claim overlooks that Mr. Avery only uses the violation of the statute to show the state's bad faith in breaching its duty of notice. A prosecutor has a duty to preserve potentially useful evidence for trial. Arizona versus Youngblood and California versus Trombetta. While the Trombetta and Youngblood evidence preservation doctrines originally applied only when evidence was destroyed pre-trial, the Wisconsin Court of Appeal stated that Trombetta and Youngblood and Wisconsin's two-part Greenwald test are applicable to the post-conviction destruction of evidence in State versus Parker in 2002. The state claims that Parker should be overturned after a quick read, however. The state claims that Parker should be overturned after a quick read. However, Parker has been followed and affirmed by numerous decisions and is void of any negative analysis. Therefore, the state's argument is devoid of any rationale for overturning this court's prior decision. Now, the bone fragments recovered from the gravel pit constitute, constitute apparent or potentially exculpatory evidence. The state misconstrues the apparent or potentially exculpatory exculpatory nature of the Manitrop gravel county gravel pit which we call it the gravel pit bone fragments mr avery presented the affidavit of dr dehan that miss halbot did not burn in mr avery's burn pit and her bones were planted there dr dehan opined that miss halbach was burned in a burn barrel and it is undisputed that larger human bones were found in the Dassey burn bowel. A human scapula, portions of a spinal column, metacarpals and long bone fragments. The Dassey burn bowel bones had cut marks. The gravel pit bones had cut marks. By destroying the gravel pit bones, the state prevented Dr. Symes Mr. Avery's expert for matching the cut marks between the burn barrel and gravel pit, thereby establishing that the Dassey burn barrel was the primary burn site. This evidence would establish a direct connection between the Dassey burn barrel, the mutilation of Miss Holbach, and the subsequent planting of bones in Mr. Avery's burn pit. Clearly, the killer performed all of these tasks. Let's just go back up here. The state incorrectly argues that district attorney's office for the third judicial district versus Osborne should control rather should control rather than Parker. However, Osborne does not apply because it is a uh, 1983 claim and the petitioner did not attempt to follow the state procedure. Okay, let's carry on then. Um, Dr. Dehan ruled out tyres as the, as the accelerant. Dr. Eisenberg claimed that she detected the odour of a flammable liquid and not burned rubber 
from the bones in the Dassey Bowl, which the state claimed was the accelerant used by Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery was deprived of the opportunity to link the gravel bones accelerant to the Dassey burn bowel bones. The evidence against Bobby of motive and opportunity is apparent. Avery's brief. Additionally, if the gravel pit and Dassey burn bowel bones had been linked, the state star witness would be converted into the primary suspect. Dr. DeHaan opines that the bones in Mr. Avery's burn pit were planted after being burned in a burn bowel. Dr. DeHaan stated, the discovery of larger fragments outside the margins of, the, of Steve's burn pit and the finding of human bone fragments with similar degrees of fire damage in numerous other areas is also consistent with the dumping of burn remains into the alleged burn pit with some rolling or landing with some of them rolling or landing outside the pit. If Mr. Avery establishes in an, in an evidentiary hearing that the primary burn site was the Dassey burn bowel and the bones from that bowel were planted in Mr. Avery's burn pit, that evidence would be potentially exculpatory and would undermine confidence in his verdict. Mr. Avery has established that the state acted in bad faith. Now, bad faith can be shown by proof of an, of an official animus or a conscious effort to suppress exculpatory evidence. See Jimerson versus Bain. Further, under certain circumstances, it is permissible to draw an adverse inference against the government when it destroys evidence. So in United States versus Davis in 2012, um, vacated on other grounds by US statute, etc. Bad, bad faith can also be inferred from the fact that the prosecutor deliberately misled the jury into believing that there was no possibility of human bones in the quarry. Now, in Jimerson versus Payne, the Eighth Circuit held that the defendant established a Youngblood violation re regarding a recording that was either lost or destroyed. Okay, the Eighth Circuit acknowledged, without the recording, we cannot ascertain its significance. However, the fact that it existed and the state failed to disclose it demonstrated a conscious effort to suppress evidence. The reasoning in Jimerson should be applied to Mr. Avery's case to find that the bad faith element has been satisfied because the prosecutor deliberately failed to preserve relevant evidence. Now, I think we get towards the end. Seven. Because Mr. Avery's factual allegations must be assumed as true, he is entitled to an evidentiary hearing. Mr. Avery's motion for relief was filed pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 97406, which requires a hearing unless the motion and the files and records of the action conclusively show that the person is entitled to no relief. Okay. The statute requires that the circuit court hold an evidentiary hearing when the movement states sufficient material facts that, if true, would entitle the defendant to relief. State versus Allen, 2004. In making this determination, the court must assume the facts alleged are true. Stop citing State versus Bentley. State versus uh, Zeely. And in quote, because the circuit court did not hold an evidentiary hearing on Zeely's motion, we will assume that the factual allegations in her motion are true. Now, even if the facts assumed to be true se seem questionable, 
in their believability, the circuit court must hold a hearing. State, State versus Littner. Stating that when credibility is an issue, it is best resolved by live testimony. Further, factual disputes may only be resolved at an evidentiary hearing. The following chart illustrates the facts that must be assumed as true for Mr. Avery and the factual disputes raised by the state, which necessitate an evidentiary hearing. So we've got topic, facts assumed to be true, state's dispute of Mr. Avery's facts, Brady violations. Obviously, Kevin Ramlow, affidavit with regard to the um, BAB4 being planted. Um, and now Kevin's affidavit is true. And Kevin saw the RAV4 on November the 4th, 2005, illustrating that it was planted. And the state's theory that the RAV4 never left the Avery property is demonstra demonstrably false. Kevin's affidavit impeaches um, Andy Corbyn's testimony that he was not looking at the RAV4 when he made the dispatch call regarding the vehicle's license plate. Because trial defence counsel did not have a police report documenting Sergeant Colburn's conversation with uh, Kevin Ramlow, they could not impeach Sergeant Colburn. The chronology of the 30 tracks of the Manitrop County Sheriff's Department calls to dispatch show that the, uh, <laughs> the, that the phone call and his phone call was made on November the 4th, 2005. <laughs> the state's argument. Ramlo, Kev Kevin seeing a similar car somewhere, fails to adapt, establish any fact about the RAV4 being planted. The photograph of the poster seen by Kevin Ramlo at the gas station included a photograph of Teresa's car. Now, assuming Kevin Ramlow's contentions are true, Kevin Ramlow never even knew that Teresa's car actually looked like because he never saw a picture. Okay, let's carry on. Redant affidavit that the RAV4 was planted. The Josh Redant affidavit is true. The Department of Justice agents knew that the RAV4 was planted on the Avery property but the state avery does not say who randant had this conversation with when it occurred what the context was what this person's belief was based on or why redant did not tell trial counsel or anywhere else about it in the 12 years between trial and his affidavit josh redant's affidavit contradicts the state's representation to the jury that the avery property was inaccessible from the redant kit pit there was a 20-foot berm separating avery's trailer from access to the rest of the salvage yard and the redant pit okay video flyover flyover video rav4 planted after uh, the fourth of um the fourth which had been the friday the flyover video was deliberately edited to conceal that the RAV4 was not present on the Avery property on November the 4th, on the Friday. On November the 4th, Randy Baldwin, Miss Baldwin, and uh, Jerry Polgill conduct conducted a flyover searching for the RAV4. They were in the air for around four hours, yet produced only three minutes of flyover footage. Prosecutor Kratz made a material admission when he told the jury that the RAV4 was not visible in the flyover video. Now, the state, Avery's claim that the flyover video was edited was utterly devoid of facts and relied wholly on Avery's speculation that more footage must have existed because the prosecutor said the RAV4 was not visible on the video and the flyover produced only three minutes 
of footage. A credibility determination must be made of the crap statement that the vehicle was not present. A Zipra answering machine, Mrs. Halbach killed after she left the Avery salvage yard. The Zipra voicemail was concealed because it demonstrated that Miss Halbach's final stop was the Zipras and not the Averys. The contents of the Zipra voicemail may have contradicted the timeline established by the state that Miss Holbach's last stop was the Avery Salvager. Miss Zipra testified at trial that Miss Holbach arrived at their property at 3 p.m. The state placed Miss Holbach at the Avery property at approximately 2.30. State's argument, nothing about Helbach leaving a voicemail at 2.12 p.m., stating that she can't find the Zipras house, but then later arriving at 3 p.m., does anything to contradict the timeline established by the state. Uh, so, Heitel's affidavit, Miss Helbach's day planner was in the RAV4 on uh, Halloween and then in the possession of Ryan Hilgas. Ryan Hillegas is established as a third party Denny suspect because he was in possession of Miss Holbuck's day planner. <laughs> the state's argument there is no proof that this was Miss Holbuck's day planner. Yeah, of course. Uh, obviously, Ryan copies everything that uh, Teresa did. Okay. Detective Veely's CD. Detective Mike Veely's CD contained new material evidence that had been pre previously concealed from prior counsel. The forensic findings and op op opinions of Def Detective Veely were entirely contained on the CD in his final report and not on the seven DD DVDs. The CD contained reco recovered pornography. The seven DVDs did not contain the results of Detective Veely's unique search terms found exclusively on the CD. Those search re results are as follows. Um, 2,632 search results for the terms blood, one, body, 2,083, bondage, three, bullet, 10, cement, 23, DNA, three, fire, 51, gas, 50, gun, 75, handcuff, two, Journal 106, MySpace 61, News 54, RAV 74, STAB 32, Throat 2 and Tires 2. The state. Avery does not point to items of evidence he did not have that were on the VLCD, but not the hard drive. He just complains that he could not have guessed what search terms really used during his examination. Impeachment of Bobby Das's trial testimony. Bobby committed perjury at Mr. Avery's trial when he testified that he never saw Miss Harbuck leave the Avery property. The state's argument, Avery fails to explain why a single statement from Brian to the police that Bobby Harbuck saw Teresa leave the property would have tipped the scales when the wealth of other evidence pointed at Avery and when the jury already heard multiple other accounts that conflicted with Bobby Das's testimony. Now this CD came, contained exculpatory material evidence that was directly relevant to the credibility of Bobby and would have allowed trial defence counsel to allege Bobby committed the crime and the state's failure to disclose it violated Mr. Avery's due process right to a fair trial. Only Bobby had access to the computer during the day on the weekends when the violent, on the weekdays when the violent pornography searches were conducted. If we just go back up here to the state. Um, the fact that someone views violent pornography does not dis diminish their credibil credibility as a witness, as Avery claims. Though distasteful, it has nothing to do with their truthfulness. 
Let's see what they put here. Wisconsin statute provides that evidence of other crimes and or wrongs and or acts when offered as proof of motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, or absence of mistake or accident is admissible. The court in Dresler versus McCautry held that the acts admitted pursuant to this section were the defendant's possession of the pornographic video tapes and pictures. Uh, so, nor would viewing violent pornography refute anything about Bobby's claim that he never saw Miss Harbuck leave the Avery property. However, Bobby's trial testimony that he was asleep from 6.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. was contradicted by current post-conviction counsel's expert, Mr. Hunt, who found that Bobby accessed the computer six times during that time frame. Okay, factual disputes regarding the ineffective assistance of counsel claims. Blood spatter expert James Stuart James. The blood spatter in the RAV4 was selectively planted and did not come from an actively bleeding finger. The state's argument. But Stuart James's experiments simply assume a number of variables that Stuart James cannot account for, such as how deep. Avery's reopened cut was, how much a partially healed cut would have bled, how he moved about the RAV4, and the many other ways blood flakes could end up somewhere. Nonsense. Bullet fragment item FL. Bullet fragment item FL never passed through Theresa Holbach's skull as the state state's expert opined. It doesn't matter, Ken, if you never opined it. The state expert Jensen certainly did. The state's forensic pathologist, Dr. Jensen, testified that Miss Halbert's course of death was the result of one or two gunshot wounds to her head. Dr. Jensen testified that Miss Halbert's DNA got on item FL when it traveled through her brain, causing her death. Okay. Dr. Eisenberg testified that there was no evidence of other gunshot wounds to the bones from other parts of Miss Holbuck's body. But con the state, but contrary to what Avery claims, no one ever said that FK or FL were the two bullets fired into Miss Holbuck's skull. Avery made that inferential leap on his own. Okay, so groin swab planted. The groin swab was substituted for the hood latch swab by investigator Mark Wiegert, either the Bert or the Ernie. Investigator Wiegert hand printed Department Hawkins name on the form, again deliberately misidentifying de de um, Depp. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, Depp? I'm not, not sure. Um, the officer Hawkins as the submitting deputy, deputy Hawkins as the submitting officer, which was a complete misrepresentation. The state fails to acknowledge the significance of investigator Wiegert signing deputy Hawkins name on the form when he delivered the alleged hood latch swap. State's argument is that Avery based this scenario entirely on the failure of the nurse to note on her report that a groin swab had been taken but discarded, which according to him, a well-qualified nurse would have done. And the fact that we get the fast bender instructions, instructed Deputy Hawkins and Sergeant Tyson to swab the hood latch, battery cables and interior and exter exterior door handles, but did not include the interior hood release lever and hood prop hmm. okay moving on um her, mr hilliger's evidence the trial defense counsel was ineffective in failing to investigate ryan as a third party denny suspect state's argument avery provided nothing establishing one that the abusive relationship holbach supposedly was in was with hilliger's Two, that Hilligus knew about Holbach's sexual, sexual history with Blodon. 
Scott Blodel, and even if Hillegas knew, Ryan knew about it, he had cared that, that he cared. Avery just proclaimed, proclaimed with no evidence whatsoever that Ryan committed perjury about it. It must be assumed that Ryan was in possession of Miss Holbrook's day planner. Okay, there is no proof that this was Miss Holbrook's day planner. The subkey planted location. Bookcase experiment demonstrates that state's trial theory about the discovery of Miss Holbrook's key in Mr. Avery's bedroom was false. State, importantly, the experiment experiment key and landlord were able to be pushed to the back of his experimental bookcase by striking it with a photo album. <laughs> subkey planted DNA quantity. The subkey was planted in Mr. Avery's bedroom as evidenced by the bookcase experiment and DNA quantities. Dr. Reich opines that the DNA found on the Toyota subkey found in Mr. Avery's bedroom was planted. Dr. Reich con conducted experiments which demonstrated that Mr. Avery deposit deposited 10 times less DNA on the exemplar key than what was discovered by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, lab and used to convict Mr. Avery. Okay. What Avery glossed over was that he undeniably left his DNA on the exemplar key during this experiment. Avery's uh, brief 77 to 80, which again was obviously conducted in a controlled environment and cannot account for the many other variables that could lead to Avery depositing more skin cells on the key and with Avery in a different physical condition than one would be when trying to hide evidence of a murder. Significance of subkey. Dr. Reich opines that the DNA found on the Toyota subkey found in Mr. Avery's bedroom was planted. Dr. Reich conduct, conducted experiments which demonstrated that Mr. Avery deposited 10 times less DNA on the exemplar key than, that, than what was discovered by the Wisconsin crime lad and used to convict Mr. Holbach, I think, read that already? No, maybe not. Second, like his hoodlash experiment, Avery's experiment holding an exemplar key bolsters rather than weakens the state's case. Electronic devices planted. Current post-conviction counsel's investigator conducted a series of experiments refuting Mr. Fabian's trial testimony that on October the 31st, he was in the vicinity of Mr. Avery's burn barrel and smelled a distinct odor of burning plastic coming from Mr. Avery's burn barrel. Avery's experiment could not account for environmental conditions on October the 31st, 2005, any sensitivities of Mr. Fabian's or the fact that Avery clearly put other items in the barrel as well. Young blood violations, destruction of the bones. The circuit called erred in concluding that the Manitoc gravel, gravel pit bones were non-human when in fact the Manitoc Karori bones were labelled as human by Dr. Eisenberg Leslie in her reports describing pop property tag numbers 7411, 7412, um, human and non-human bone, 5 of 13 burnt, calcined with cut edges, most bone fragments are all cut bone fragments are human. 714, one bird human fragment. 7, 7414, burnt calcite human bone fragments. 7416, human bone fragments. Human is calcined with one cut edge. And 7419, cut burnt human bone. Okay, what are they saying? None of the bone fragments recovered from the locations in the quarry were positively identified as human, let alone the remains of trees of Holbach. Yeah. So why were they handed back to the family? Good question. Hopefully we'll get an answer something. Brady violation leading to Leon blood violation. It must be assumed that there was a Brady violation when the state failed to disclose the police report. The failure to disclose the police report led to the destruction of the gravel pit bones of which 
prior post-conviction counsel was unaware there must be an evidentiary hearing to determine whether prior post-conviction post-conviction counsel knew of the specific bone fragments that were given to the Holbach family. The state has conceded that there would have been a Brady violation if prior post-conviction counsel did not know about the evidence that was destroyed. Conclusion. Okay, here we go. I think this is just about it. For the reasons stated herein, Stephen Avery respectfully requests that this court grant him one of the following alternative remedies. One, reverse the orders denying post-conviction relief and, and remand for the state to file a response to the motion for post-conviction relief and order additional scientific testing per the September 18, 2017 agreement and or grant an evidentiary hearing to reverse the judgments of conviction and the orders denying post-conviction relief and remand for a new trial. Dated this day, 25th day of June, 2020. Um, obviously, it's uh, Kathleen Zellner and Stephen Richards. Um, a certificate of com compliance, I hear, but I've submitted an electronic copy. Uh, this electronic brief is identical in context um, to the printed form of the brief file on this date. A copy of the certificate has been served with proper copies of this brief. And I think somewhere you, she mentions that anybody missing it can just catch it on the, on this YouTube channel. So anyway, um, I think we've just about done with the, uh, we've gone through everything there. <laughs> yes, Jane, I, the, the dep, dep bit, it, it had me for a while until I realized deputy. Um, very interesting, um, more or less what we, what we were expecting. Um, an absolute load of load of nonsense from the state totally um sort of rebuted but re, um, yeah um as i say she she used the word estopped that it's not the state that are procedurally barred they are procedurally barred from it from trying to suggest any kind of procedural bar um it seemed uh, seemed quite a good uh, Quite a good, um, an excellent response. Um, I, 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 I can only imagine that um, the uh, the appeals court, having already sent it back twice to uh, uh, at Judge Angie, um, I, 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 I can only see them um, thinking, "What, what on earth is going on here?" Um, that there is clearly some. Uh, shenanigans going on down there in um, or up there depending where they're looking from whether it's milwaukee or madison but anyway um the district two of the um court of appeals i think it's north of Mil milwaukee all the way up to um sheboygan manitrock and uh, two rivers and um all along the coast anyway anyway um Let's let's uh, let's let's wait and see what um, what happens now. What the uh, circuit court, uh, sorry, the court of appeals, which, as I say, I believe it's um, the, the judge that's looked at the case so far is a uh, judge Paul Riley. Now, Judge Paul Riley has been there long enough so that he knows about the the previous um, filings back in 2013 of. Um, the original per, um, um, petitions by Stephen Avery. So uh, I, th I think that Judge Riley knows knows what he's doing, um, and I, I can only go by the fact that in in some of his previous judgments, he's been pretty condescending and uh, not very impressed with uh, Judge Angie. So hopefully that's exactly what's going to happen in. Um, in this case, that um, well, I think he's um, 
like she said at the end of the brief, she either wants um, an ev evidentiary hearing or, you know, why, why not just dismiss the case? But anyway, um, I'm sure it will be a case of, uh, ideally, we want more evidence. We want all of the evidence that's available handed over to Kathleen Zellner, do a thorough investigation, find out who's, who's, blood is on the back of the RAV4, whose bloody handprint is on that, <coughs> excuse me, on the rear door handle. Um, and I think that would, that, that would probably just solve the case there and then. Okay. Um, thanks very much for tuning in. I'm sorry I've kept you. This, this is quite unusual to do a, to do a live for an hour and 25 minutes. And the, and the dude calls me the haver. Maybe I am. Anyway, um, thanks very much for joining in. Um, and uh, we'll catch you soon. Okay, cheers. Bye for now.